Hello everyone, let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Ramaswamy Subramanian, a physician and a non-invasive cardiologist from India. I have the opportunity to work as a clinical research fellow in US for five years, I think from 98 to 2003. I worked in uh, Stony Brook uh, University in uh, Long Island and uh, Portchester University in New York. There I got exposed into exposure into enhanced external counterpulsation. That during this time EECP is evaluating or is under the evaluation to become a treatment for patient with angina and heart failure. So I did a lot of clinical work with EECP and published papers in American Journal of Cardiologists. Later I moved to India. There my ambition is to start this standalone EECP center for refractive angina and for heart failure. Currently I do around 30 centers I have established in India and my core uh, interest is to, to develop a heart failure clinic. So I have tied up with uh, one of the second largest group of hospital chain in the world, Glen Eagles Global Hospital. And we have put more than 30 centers across India to treat cardiac patient non-invasively as an outpatient basis through enhanced external counterpulsation. With this background, I just want to get into this subject. And my objective is here to talk about the role of EECP in clinical cardiology. So the presenting objective is number one, before getting into the EECP treatment as such, I want to give you an overview of the management of stable ischemic heart disease patient and then move on to enhance external counterpulsation and talk about the acute hemodynamic benefit which the patient achieved during the treatment and then the overall mechanism of action and then I will roll into role of EECP in patient with angina and heart failure and some of the studies and outcome when we use EECP in this group of patients. And finally, I'll go for patient selection and the future role of EECP. So when we go to the management of patient with stable ischemic heart disease with symptom, it's actually a complex way of looking at a complex disease. So this uh, diagram will give you an overview. So basically, when a patient walked into with a chest pain, we do a lot of investigation to assess whether this patient has an ischemic symptom related to cardiac disease. So what is ischemia? Ischemia is a condition where there is a lack of blood flow to the heart muscle and because of the lack of blood flow to the heart muscle, the patient experiences some symptoms, chest pain or chest discomfort or shortness of breath or various conditions which make him uh, to not to able to do routine activity with ease which they were used to do before. So once it is done, the cardiologist after confirming very clearly that is because of ischemia by using certain diagnostic cells like a echo or a treadmill or a nuclear perfusion scan and they put the patient on medical management. So what is the objective of medical management and what are the medication they would use to manage patient with ischemic heart disease. So basically nitrate and then they add on some calcium channel blocker or AC inhibitor and so many classes of drugs are added to make sure the patient achieve good symptom relief. So the patient is put in the initial medical management. What is the objective of medical management is to improve the quality of life, decrease the symptom and change the outcome. So what is the outcome? Once they put on the medical management, this medical management will protect the patient against future occurrence of myocardial infarction or stroke or renal failure or unstable angina. So once it is achieved, the patient is asymptomatic, they are managed in medical management itself. Many times, even when they put on the patient with optimal medical management, the patient would not respond to the medical management, they have a recurrent symptoms. So once they have recurrent symptoms, then they move forward from medical management to what we call as an interventional procedure. So before going for an interventional procedure, the patient is put on a coronary angiography and they assess the vascular burden or the anatomical burden or how many lesions are there and what is the location of this lesion. So based on this lesion, then the cardiologist or a cardiothoracic surgeon would make a decision whether the patient would go for a bypass surgery or would go for an angioplasty. Now once the patient is going for a bypass surgery, it is a procedure where a graft is taken either from the leg which is a saphenous graft or from the hand which is a radial graft or internal mammary artery. So the graft is used to bypass the obstruction so that the blood flow is restored back in the ischemic area back to normal. So many times after the bypass surgery itself, sometimes the graft may close. This we call as a graft occlusion. So similarly, when the patients are chosen for an angioplasty, they open up the vessel which is called simply angioplasty or they may put what we call as a uh, drug eluding stent or bare metal stent or bioabsorbable stent. 
So, this tensor position in such a way the vessel is open. So, the blood flow is restored. Similar to the bypass surgery here also they are trying to restore the blood back into this ischemic area. Now, the cycle is not still completed. Even though the patient is having a bypass surgery and angioplasty both of them are only a palliative treatment and it is not a curative treatment. Because the disease as such is the formation of the blockage in the vessel remains with the patient and we temporarily improve the circulation by opening the uh, vessel or by grafting the vessel. So, in due course of time or many of the patient after 5 to 10 years the graft can able to occlude again which we call as a graft occlusion or the stent may close again we call it the stent restenosis or thrombosis. Once it is happened the cycle starts again the patient has to be re-evaluated to using the invasive or non-invasive diagnostic procedure and again they put on the optimal medical management. Many times the disease would not stop here. Now from angina many times the patient slip into what we call as a heart failure because if that heart attack happens during this process of management of the patient the heart function would reduce and now the patient who is an angina now become a heart failure. So, what would be the management for a heart failure? It is completely a different scenario when management of patient with ischemic heart disease with stable condition and with a preserved airway function. Now, we have a two part of the disease. One is an angina and heart failure, but the disease itself is the same. It is a management in the different spectrum of the same disease process. Now, with this introduction, let us go to the hemodynamics of heart. So, heart is an organ which pumps in the chest cavity from the day you are born to the day your death. So, this heart has to pump continuously and reluctantly because I said reluctantly because even though we are exposed to a lot of risk factor like I mean hypercholesteremia or dyslipidemia or hypertension or diabetes in spite of all the risk factor obesity lack of exercise the heart reluctantly pump. So, what happen is when you look at this diagram the top one I have given the ECG. So, if you look at the heart it has two phase one is a systolic and then the diastolic phase. So, the heart contracts it is called systole when the heart relaxes it is called diastole. So, during the systolic phase it I have shown here the ECG and down if you see there is a significant increase in the left ventricular pressure because uh, the chamber contracts when the chamber contracts it increase the pressure in the left ventricle and push the blood from the left ventricle into the circulation it enter into the iota. So, you can see the aortic pressure also increases and then because of the aortic pressure increases what we call as a stroke volume the blood is pushed into the circulation and if you look at the uh, lower bottoms uh, of the slide you can see there is a red curve one is mentioned as systole another one is a diastole. So, here this is what the coronary blood flow happens. So, when the heart contracts the entire body gets a circulation. So, all your organ your, your uh, brain, your kidney, your liver all of them get the maximum blood supply during the systolic phase. But if you see here the heart itself as an organ which pump this blood get very less blood supply probably around 20 percent. The reason is very evident here in the right side of the slide. You can see the coronary artery which supplies uh, blood to the myocardium actually gets squeezed because of the contraction of the ventricle. So, the coronary filling or the coronary vessel become a high resistance pathway. Because it is a high resistance pathway the blood flow do into the coronary artery is very less. So, it is only 20 percent of the flow happen during the systolic phase. Then when actually the heart itself gets its blood supply it is contrary to what happens in a systemic circulation. So, in the systemic circulation all the organs gets a blood supply during the systolic phase, but the heart itself gets a maximum blood supply only during the diastolic phase. So, you can see here the diagram almost 80 percent of the flow to the coronary because during the relaxation of the heart now the coronary vessel also dilate and then the pathway become least resistance. The coronary filling take place during the diastolic phase. Now, this is a very important concept and my whole presentation would depend upon this simple concept that the blood flow to the heart happens exactly during the diastolic phase. So, now cut to the next slide. So, this was this concept was adapted in 1960s by Bretwell. So, he found out if I can able to increase the pressure during the diastolic phase the coronary perfusion pressure can increase and the diastolic blood flow because the coronary filling happens during the diastolic phase it can increase the coronary blood flow to the coronaries and the myocardium can able to get more blood supply. This concept was introduced by Bridgewell in 1960s. So, obviously, he cannot do it in a human. So, what he did is he took an animal and then he took a cannula 
and this cannula is introduced into the femoral artery and then he push the blood into the circulation during the diastolic and then pull the blood outside the circulation through, through this cannula. So, it is like when he push the blood back into the circulation it increases the diastolic pressure and the assumption is it may increase the diastolic flow into the coronary artery. But we all know now exactly what will happen if you pull and push the blood out of the circulation it cause massive hemolysis and it would not put any effort but the concept has been created. Now, this concept has been translated into an animal model into the human model and that is what we call as intra aortic balloon pump. Now, this intra aortic balloon pump has found in favor in every intensive care unit hospital across the world. So, what it actually does is instead of the cannula there is a catheter which was introduced into the femoral artery and then slowly moved into the aorta and in the aorta it was positioned and in the tip of the catheter would have a balloon and this balloon will inflate and deflate in exactly in sync with the EKG. So, exactly during the diastolic phase of the heart this balloon which inflates, so probably it may be displacing around 30 to 40 ml of blood into the coronary circulation and increase the blood flow into the coronary vessels. And during the systole when the heart is about to unload the blood flow into the systemic circulation, since the balloon is positioned in the iota, the balloon deflates. So, what when it deflates, it reduces the afterload. So, the heart can be able to easily push the blood into the circulation because of the afterload reduction or of the sudden decrease in the pressure in the iota. So, this is a basic principle of what we call as intraiotic balloon pump. And the problem is when you put an intraiotic balloon pump, now we need an emergency setup and we need a very highly trained interventional cardiologist to place the balloon into the iota at the exact point which is, is required. And also the intraiotic balloon pump is used to support the heart. It is a kind of a ventricular assist device. So, whenever there is a cardiogenic shock, when we want to increase the blood flow to the heart muscle, the pump is positioned in the iota so that the pump can able to increase the coronary perfusion pressure and the flow into the coronary artery. Now, this is a good aspect of the intraiotic balloon pump. So, what is the bad part of the intraiotic balloon pump is because it is very, very invasive. It cannot be left there for a long period of time. So, some of the complication which is, uh, 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 which is along with the introduction of uh, intraiotic balloon pump is aortic dissection or it can cause gangrene, thrombocytopenia purpura or any vascular complication. These are all dreaded complication. So, you may not able, you cannot able to leave this uh, balloon for a long period probably 4 to 5, five days. Now, when the intra balloon, intraiotic balloon pump was in the uh, evaluation period, there was a simultaneously parallelly what they were doing is instead of a balloon which be placed in the iota, what they did is they put the balloon into the periphery. So, it is called a periphery balloon or it we call as enhanced or it called external counter pulsation it is absolutely external and instead of a balloon placed in the iota, they put the cuff in the lower limb and they have wrapped the calf lower thigh and upper thigh region and the principle is very similar to the intraiotic balloon. It is also ECG gated in the sense by EKG or the ECG it can able to inflate and deflate the cuff in sync with the ECG. Now, the only difference between the intraiotic balloon pump and the external counter pulsation is as you said the intraiotic balloon pump is positioned in the iota. So, it is going to affect only the blood flow into the iota or the arterial end. And since the cuff is placed in the periphery, it compresses two compartments, both the arterial and venous. And second is it is completely non-invasive and external. It can be left as, as much time as possible and it can be given for a long period of time. Now, the early external counter pulsation is very cumbersome device as you are seeing from this figure, the patient lying down with kind of like a suit. And so, it is actually a, a hydraulic one rather than the pneumotic. So, what they do is they put this a huge device in the ICU where the patient lie down on the treatment table and the suit is put on the patients which cover the entire lower limb and then the inflation and deflation is again sink. But the huge problem related to this uh, cumbersome device is it is number one is hydraulic and sometimes if it is a rupture or if there is a leakage, the entire ICU will be flooded with water. So, it is kind of little bit uh, difficult to put this on the patient and also because of the hydraulic, the timing is very difficult. When the patient heart rate goes beyond 90, it is very difficult to uh, inflate and deflate in sync with the heart rate because the hydraulic pressure is difficult to uh, increase the uh, uh, water inflation and deflation because of the high heart rate. 
So, this was not actually that successful even though some trial was done in a patient with cardiogenic and myocardial infarction, it shows much better than the medical management. But once the intraortic balloon pump was in the ICU, it was slowly discontinued. Now, uh, you can see the new device now the EECP, it does not look as bad as what it looks at the hydraulic one. So, this is a pneumotic one where the patient lie down on the treatment table. The treatment protocol for enhanced external counter pulsation is very simple. The patient come every day one hour continuously for 35 days and spend one hour in the EECP treatment bed. And you can see here three sets of cuff, one in the lower calf, lower thigh and upper thigh region and the patient is connected to the EKG and the finger probe or uh, we call it as a plethysmogram will assess the patient's waveform by using a patient's own EKG and the finger probe, the arterial waveform, we may able to adjust the inflation and deflation of the cuff so that the patient treatment has been standardized. So, this is basically what enhanced external counter pulsation treatment procedures depends on. Now, let us look at the operation. So, how actually the treatment procedure is done? If you look here, the three sets of cuff, one in the lower calf, one in the lower thigh, another one in the upper thigh region. So, three sets of cuff are tied into the lower limb and now as I said the patient was gated to the EKG exactly during the diastolic phase with a pressure of around 260 to 300 millimeter mercury pressure. The cuffs are equated sequentially which from, from the calf, lower thigh and the uh, thigh, upper thigh region. So, from the distal to the proximal in a sequential way it collects a milking effect because each cuff the calf to lower thigh and lower thigh to upper thigh there is a 50 millisecond delay. So, the squeezing is done in the lower limb with a pressure around 260 millimeter mercury pressure. So, during this period the two compartments which is on the lower limbs are compressed one is an arterial compartment and one is a venous compartment. So, when you compress the arterial compartment there is a retrograde blood from the leg from the femoral artery it enter into the iota ascending descending and then by the time the blood enter into the descending iota the aortic valve is already closed because if you are timing it exactly during the diastolic phase. So, when the aortic valve is closed the blood cannot enter the left ventricle and on the base of the iota is where your coronary artery is originating. So, what happen is this blood impinge on the aortic wall and then slowly go into the coronary and increase the coronary filling pressure or coronary perfusion pressure. So, the blood can enter into the coronary vessel. So, the arterial compression will lead to increased coronary perfusion pressure. At the same time, the venous end, the venous compression what happen is the, the blood flow into the venous tract, it go to the right atrium and then into the right ventricle and the ventricle contract pushing this excess blood into the pulmonary circulation. From pulmonary circulation, it enter again into the right atrium and from right atrium, it enter uh, uh, from the left sorry from the left atrium, it enter into the left ventricle and the left ventricle, it pumps into the circulation. Because you are increasing the venous return, it also increases the cardiac output. So, two things are achieved. One is the increased coronary perfusion and second is the increased cardiac output. Both are achieved by inflating the cuff in sync with the EKG. Now, look at the deflation. So, the deflation of the cuffs are timed exactly during the P wave or what we call as a prayer to the systole. So, the, when the heart is ready to go for the systole, the, the cuffs which is on the periphery, the calf, lower thigh and the upper thigh side simultaneously deflate. So, what happen is it suddenly releases the pressure and it create the vacuum in the lacquer limb or with a sudden decrease in the total peripheral vascular resistance. So, when the total peripheral vascular resistance is significantly reduced because of the dilatation of the vessel, now the heart can easily empty the circulation or empty the volume of blood into the left ventricle into the circulation in an easier way because there is a empty space which can easily accommodate the uh, flow which is going to come from the left ventricle. So, this is what we call as a after load reduction. So, when there is a reduction in the after load, the heart can pump easily. So, the cardiac output increases and the after load reduction is uh, the after load is reduced, the myocardial oxygen consumption is also reduced. So, you can you can achieve two things during EECP. You are increasing the supply at the similar time you are decreasing the demand. So, the oxygen consumption to the myocardium also is decreased. So, now we are going to see what really happened during EECP which we call as a acute hemodynamic effect of EECP which I explained to you is similar to intraortic balloon pump. Now, the first question anybody would ask you 
or ask me is when I put the pressure in the lower leg and compress the blood flow into the in your leg, which is a femoral artery, would it really have any effect in your central circulation? So, the central circulation is your coronary and your iota. So, to find out, we really have to measure the changes in pressure, velocity and flow in the central hemodynamics. So, how would you do that? So, in, in I think in 2002, uh, they put a catheter which is uh, tipped with a sensor into the iota and slowly move into the coronary artery. So, they were able to measure the pressure directly in an invasive procedure in a cath lab and they try to find out whether giving pressure in the lower leg would uh, increase the central pressure also. Now, here I am going to show you a tracing which was done in a cath lab. So, you can see the first one there is a systolic wave and then down sloping uh, diastole and you can see the blub that is a dichroic notch and the down sloping diastole and end diastolic pressure and again there is a systole. So, this is the actual tracing which we see when we put an IABP. Now, I am going to show when the pressure is increased in the periphery from a baseline to 100, 150, 200, 250 and 300. So, when the gradually the pressure is increased in the lower limb, we like to measure the pressure in the central hemodynamic exactly into the intracoronary inter pressure. So, let us look at the intracoronary pressure and see what is the change happens when we increase the pressure in the leg. You can see the first when you put the pressure about 100 millimeter mercury pressure, we do not see much of a change, but you can see there is a small that blub, the dichroic notch. We call this as a dichroic notch. This is where the aortic wall close. So, when you put the inflation exactly during the diastolic phase, you can see the small pressure developing after the dichroic notch and this increased pressure which is called as a diastolic augmentation. When you look at the 150, 200, 250 and 300, you can see the tracing. The diastolic pressure slowly raises in the 150 and by the 200, the diastolic pressure is higher than the systolic pressure. By the time of 250 and 300, you can see significant rise in the diastolic pressure. So, you do not only see the diastolic pressure, if you look at the systolic pressure, the systolic pressure is falling down. So, this is what we call as unloading or the afterload reduction. The systolic pressure is falling because the heart is not finding any resistance when it is pumping out because of the deflation of the cuff and the diastolic pressure is going up because the, the cuffs are timed exactly during the diastolic pressure, diastolic period. So, the flow is increasing during the diastolic pressure, diastolic uh, period. So, you can see the diastolic pressure is rising and if you look at the when you reach around 300 millimeter mercury pressure, you can see a significant rise in diastolic pressure and significant drop in the systolic pressure and there is a significant drop in the end diastolic pressure also. Now, this is what we are achieving during the enhanced external counterpulsation treatment, one hour period. So, your intracoronary diastolic pressure from 71 millimeter mercury pressure to shoot to almost 136 millimeter mercury pressure, which is almost 92 percent increase in the diastolic pressure. And second, the velocity, because you are pushing the blood with a higher velocity, it is not only there is a pressure increase, but there is also a significant increase in velocity. You can see the velocity is increased from 18 uh, plus or minus 7 uh, centimeter per second to 45 meter, uh, centimeter per second, which is a significantly 150 uh, percentage of increase in the velocity. Now, many times the question asks, EECP is very similar to the exercise. Would I do an exercise rather than doing an EECP? Now, this is what I would tell them. Now, look at the pressure and the velocity rise. The pressure of increasing to 92 percent and the velocity of 150 would not be easily achieved even with an aggressive exercise because if, if you are a normal person, if you try to put yourself into exercise, your body respond by improving the diastolic pressure and velocity, but at the same time you should also remember it also increases uh, systolic pressure and the heart rate. So, when your pressure increase and the heart rate increases, it actually nullify the increase in the pressure and the velocity in the coronary artery. So, I would say this much of achievement of increased pressure and velocity in the di during the diastolic phase, EECP is a unique concept which can even be applied to a very, very sick patients where they cannot even able to do a routine activity. Now, to conclude about the acute hemodynamic benefit which I have explained to you, uh, let me summarize what I have said so far. Number one, EECP cuff inflation and deflation are triggered by the patient's own EKG. Number two, 
ECP increase retrograde aortic blood flow. So, it increases the coronary perfusion pressure or coronary blood flow. Third, the enhanced external counter pulsation increases the venous return number 1, increases the cardiac output number 2, it decreases the left ventricular afterload and decreases the myocardial oxygen demand. So, these effects are favorable for treating patient with ischemic symptom due to obstruction in the coronary, uh, coronary artery. Now, with this completion of this, now let us move on to the next part of this presentation, the effect of EECP in angiogenesis. Now, we see the increased pressure and velocity, how this increased pressure and velocity is actually translating into angiogenesis or new vessel formation or arteriogenesis, opening the dormant or pre-existing uh, collaterals to form new artery. So, this angiogenesis and arteriogenesis is a new concept in cardiology because now we believe 60 percent of your circulation is a microvascular circulation where your main coronary artery will contribute only around 5 to 10 percent. So, anything to improve this microcirculation will have a significant impact in the management of coronary artery disease. So, I would say angiogenesis is going to be a future in the management of coronary artery disease and EECP is one of the treatment which is actually approved by US FDA and it is also covered by Medicaid and many insurance company not only in US and also in other countries and Asia Pacific would have a significant effect on what we call as an angiogenesis. Now, the first slide the change in angiogenesis factor. Whenever you say angiogenesis, it is a factor we call as a growth factor. This growth factor, if it is kept in a high level during any treatment procedure or injecting of this growth factor into the circulation or the coronary artery directly would have a profound impact on the angiogenesis. So, during EECP, one of the investigator which is presented in circulation 2001 looked at and measured three factors which are called angiogenic factor or angiogenesis promoting factor. Number one is VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. Number two is basic fibroblast growth factor. Number three is hepatocyte growth factor. All of them significantly increase during the EECP procedure and in fact, there are studies to show this increase is actually maintained even up to one month after completing the treatment. So, this increase in uh, growth factor will create an environment in the coronary vasculature to promote angiogenesis or formation of the new vessel. Now, how do you assess the angiogenesis actually taken place? So, the only way to assess is to find out there is an increased blood flow to the ischemic myocardium. So, how do you find out? It is by uh, stress radionuclide perfusion scan. So, before going to the stress radionuclide perfusion scan, we should find there is a two pathway how the blood flow can be increased to the ischemic myocardium. So, there is a mechanical obstruction we call as a stenosis. Now, when we show the myocardial perfusion scan, if there is an increase in blood flow across the obstructed, obstructed artery, then somehow the blood flow has increased to the ischemic area. So, as I said two pathway, number one, it could be because of the mechanically dilating the vessel because I have shown in my previous slides, there is an increased pressure and velocity. This increase in pressure and velocity can increase the flow by dilating the vessel or it can cause a shear stress in the vascular endothelium and this vascular endothelium could have responded to the shear stress by increasing the growth factors which I said the VEGF or a basic fibroblast growth factor or hepatocy hepatocyte growth factor. All this growth factor can promote angiogenesis. Now, whatever the mechanism or whatever the pathway, now we are going to estimate whether there is really a significant increase in the blood flow across the blocked artery. Now, this was done by the stress radionuclide perfusion scan. I think in 2001 in Journal of Critical Illness, uh, believe it is from Lawson, they took 16 patients who have refractory angina. These are the patients who are not a candidate for further interventional procedure or they are not able to go for an interventional procedure because of the comorbid illness. So, this group of patients who has been uh, categorized as refractory angina with optimal medical management and still they have highly symptomatic with poor quality of life with class 2 and class 3. These group of patients are taken, they undergone 35 days of EECP treatment and before getting into the EECP treatment, they did the perfusion scan and this perfusion scan they were able to 
pinpoint the ischemic area and, and this where this is related to which artery this ischemia is related to and after 35 days of treatment the patient within a month period were asked to undergo another nuclear perfusion scan and this nuclear perfusion scan they evaluated whether any improvement is done into the ischemic area in, in sense previously the ischemic area whether it has improved. Now they found out significantly the patient improve in their exercise time. So, it is not only the quality of life and the angina came down, the patient was able to walk more distance on the treadmill before the ST segment depression or the ischemic changes take place and then when they did the perfusion scan post, there is significant improvement in the perfusion to the ischemic area. Now, here you can see the pre ECP, the rest is well perfused. But when the patient is stressed, the ischemia start developing in the anterior wall which is related to LAD territory. But post ECP if you can see, the patient is again rest is well perfused, but post the stress also does not cause any ischemia in the sense the reversible ischemic area is now reperfused with increased blood flow. Now this has happened in 67 percent of the patient. So, 67 percent of the patients showed a complete resolution of ischemic defect and 11 percent show partial resolution. In fact, there is some improvement to the ischemic area and 22 percent shows no change. In spite of there is no change in 22 percent, all of them significantly improved in their clinical uh, condition in the sense they walk more distance, quality of life improved, there is a decreased nitrate intake and the medication dosage has been reduced on on demand nitrate. Now, uh, based on this and when I was working with Stony Brook University and that time there was a protocol was been uh, done to show there is a clear evidence in a controlled trial patient with pre and post ECP would show significant improvement in myocardial perfusion. So, we published this uh, result in American Journal of Cardiology, the effect of ECP in stress radionuclide coronary perfusion and exercise capacity in chronic stable anginal patient. Now, it is a multicentral study and patients have been selected who have chronic stable and who are not candidate for interventional procedure which has been certified by a cardiologist or a cardiothoracic surgeon and now if you look at the demography 21 percent of them are diabetic, 9 percent have peripheral vascular disease and uh, almost uh, 51 percent has a previous history of a myocardial infarction and 75 percent has already attempted a PCI and 41 percent has already attempted a CABG a bypass surgery. So, they have uh, taken all the possible uh, treatment either a medical management and gone beyond medical management and taken an interventional procedure either a bypass or an angioplasty and still they are symptomatic. So, they did a 35 days of EECP and they were analyzed in two group. In the first group which is a four center with 97 patients, they did a pre and post EECP a safe level of exercise uh, exertion in the sense the treadmill time was kept the same which is in the pre and which is in the post. In that time, they looked at the myocardial perfusion scan and they found out 83 percent has a significant improvement in myocardial perfusion and 17 percent has no change and there is no worsening on any of these patients. And second, the group 2, here the patient was asked to do more exercise than before since their angina has come down and their exercise tolerance is improved. Obviously, they were able to do more time on the treadmill and the exercise time increased from 6 minutes 37 seconds to 7 minutes and 25 seconds which is increase of almost 48 seconds and then they repeated the nuclear perfusion scan. In that 54 percent improved the radionuclear perfusion, 42 percent there is no change and 8 percent there is a mild worsening in the perfusion defect and what we call as a double product it is not change. In the sense, the patients are exerted above the previous exercise level in spite of their put on the exertion, the double product which is a, a product of a heart rate, maximum heart rate and maximum blood pressure did not change. Now, this is a simple example to show how this myocardial perfusion can improve after a course of 35 days of EECP. It is a simple case study here, it is a triple vessel disease patient who already attempted a CABG and after uh, 6 years again he had a graft occlusion and then the repeat angiogram showed uh, it could not be grafted again because of the progression of the native vessel and occlusion of the graft which is to the LAD uh, and to the RCA. Now, what they did it when they did the uh, pre uh, myocardial perfusion scan which is rest, the patient has severe LV dysfunction less than 30 percent actually around 30 percent of ejection fraction and if you look at the myocardial perfusion, the bright area is where there is a uh, blood flow is, uh, 
is normal and you can see here which is a inferior and apex. Inferior is RCA territory and the apex is LAD territory. Now, these patients after 35 days of EECP again they did a myocardial perfusion scan, rest myocardial perfusion scan. You can see the LV or the left ventricular gated uh, I mean left ventricular ejection fraction jump from 32 to 42 percent which is a very significant increase in LV function. And you can look at the perfusion, I mean you do not need a statistician to see this because there is a significant increase in the bright area which shows there is a significant increase in the blood flow to the myocardium and there is a reversible perfusion has happened in the apex and also there is a significant improvement happened in the inferior wall. You can see still there is a defect and probably it may be an infarction because it is presented in the pre and post with no change. Now, we keep what we call as a scoring. So, pre and post the computer will automatically giving a scoring which is a 17 segment model. You can see the overall score is 1041 which is increased to uh, 1329. So, there is a significant increase in the scoring. So, there is a overall 27 percent improvement in the overall myocardial perfusion that is only have translated in improvement in the ejection fraction and translate clinically the patient become asymptomatic. He came up with a class 3 symptom now it is only class 1 occasional angina and is able to do regular activity without uh, taking a sorbitrate or a sublingual sorbitrate on demand. Now, it is not only like one or two studies there are multiple studies which has been presented to show that EECP can significantly improve the myocardial perfusion and you can see in 2002 and 2003 we did almost 175 and 200 patients have been evaluated pre and post which significantly shows a improvement in the myocardial perfusion. Now, um, as a cardiologist and as an interventionalist they look myocardial perfusion scan as an objective evidence to show there is an increase in perfusion. But any interventional cardiologist always want to see the angiogram to see whether we can visually see that the improvement in collateral has actually taken place. If you can able to visually assess the collateral then the theory it is not only because of the pressure it is dilating the vessel, but it is also because of the uh, increase in angiogenic factor the collateralization is actually taken place. So, the collat uh, coronary collateral flow index. Uh, or uh, uh, coronary collateral conductance. These are a gold standard to see by invasive catheterization method to show whether the patient has collaterals or they do not have collaterals. So, it is a randomized control study. There is a sham group and an active EECP group. In the sham group the patient comes exactly for 35 days. The machine was on, but there is no pressure is given on the lower limb. So, it might not have changed any circulation in the leg or in the central circulation. And in the active counter pulsation, the pressure has gone from 260, 280 and to the maximum of 300 millimeter mercury pressure and this significantly increase the blood flow to the coronary artery as you have shown in the previous slide. So, what really happen is in the sham group there is no change in the collateral flow index, but in the patient who have uh, undergone artery counter pulsation there is a significant increase in coronary collateral flow index. The amount of coronary collateralization increase is amazing because it is much better than what we can achieve by injecting the growth factor directly into the myocardium. So, somehow the naturally increasing angiogenic factor can able to home in directly into what it is supposed to and it can able to increase the collateralization and improve the myocardial blood flow. So, it is not only that there is another study also done in Europe by arteriogenesis network group. They also did the similar study with a sham and active and they measured what it has a collateral flow index uh, which is a pressure derived collateral flow index and also they looked at what we call as a fractional flow reserve. Fractional flow reserve it is becoming a one of the important parameter currently in clinical cardiology because now the concept of all stenosis is going to cause ischemia is slowly changing because in many times a stenosis of greater than 80 percent or up to 90 percent it is an anatomical burden, but physiologically it might not cause any ischemia or ischemic burden because it may able to retain the flow normal. So, what they do is they do the fractional flow reserve and assess whether the fractional flow reserve is normal or abnormal. If it is 0.8 then we do not need to stent the vessel, but if it is less than 0.8, 0.9, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14, 0.15, 0.16, 0.17, 0.18, 0.19, 0.20, 0.21, 0.
probably we need to stent the vessel because this anatomical stenosis is also causing a physiological obstruction and hindering the blood flow into the proximal region. So, what we do is when we do EECP as a previous study shows there is a significant improvement in the pressure derived collateral flow index. So, it is a positive trial and also the fractional flow reserve from 0.6 or 0.5 has increased up to 0.7 to 0.8. So, this shows the, the vessel the culprit vessel with obstruction after 35 days of EECP may not be required to stent because the collateral or the fractional flow index has raised in such a capacity that the flow is actually restored. So, we do not need to touch the stenosis vessel. Now, uh, from angiogenesis uh, I will go into the circulating repair cells. So, circulating endothelial progenitor cell. So, we call it as a EPC cells. The EPC cells are actually a mirror of vascular change or it is a predictor of the outcome. So, these cells are called the repair cells which are in the circulation. So, whenever you are exposed to an ischemia or a stress, this repair cells start coming into the circulation and start increasing in concentration. So, this is a very important predictor of outcome. So, somehow when you age or we have other risk factor like diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, smoking and you are not into regular exercise or you have other uh, comorbid illness affecting your uh, uh, disease condition many times this EPC cells concentration in the circulation is very less even though you have ischemia coronary artery disease. So, if you have a very low EPC cell then you have a very poor outcome. If you have a high EPC cells you have a good outcome. So, where does this EPC cell come from? So, basically they are uh, uh, they are in the bone marrow. So, when there is an ischemia or a stress they leak or they come out of the bone marrow and increase in the circulation and they go wherever it is required and start repairing cells. So, it goes to the endothelium and repair the endothelial cell. It go to the coronary circulation and promote angiogenesis. So, these repair cells are crucial for us to, uh, to preserve the health itself or to decrease the ischemia and decrease the chances of getting a future cardiovascular instead or a myocardial infarction. So, what does EECP do? Somehow when we do EECP you can see here in the control and treated in patient with control uh, which we go for a placebo treatment or they are not given EECP when compared with the treatment who are going for active counter pulsation there is a significant increase in CD34 or endothelial progenitor cell or EPC colony forming unit and also when this cells increases and when we measure what we call the brachial artery mediated dilatation. It is a simple technique to see whether there is a uh, increase in the uh, there is a improvement in the endothelial function. So, these cells EPC cells can significantly improve the endothelial function and this increase in endothelial function can be measured by what we call as a brachial flow arm technique. So, we put a cuff inflate the cuff and deflate the cuff and we cause us an hyperemia. When there is an hyperemia the brachial artery will accommodate the increased flow by dilating. If you can able to dilate up to certain extent you call the endothelial function is normal. If the dilatation is not happening then you have endothelial dysfunction. So, here in this study they correlated during EECP the EPC cells are in a high which increase in the circulation and this increased circulation is translated into repairing the endothelial cell because it also increase the brachial flow or mediated dilatation. <coughs> Like EPC there is another cell called hemopoietic progenitor cell. It function is very similar and this increase actually it is a kind of a embryogenic cell. So, once this cells uh, it is increase in the circulation it can transform itself into any, any, any cell which is required. For example, it can be transformed into a growth factor and stimulate the angiogenesis or transform into a cell which can able to repair the endothelial function. Now, basically what EECP done is because of the increased pressure and we believe and because of the flow is increased with the high uh, shear stress it dislodge or push or uh, push the circulating uh, endothelial progenitor cell or hemopoietic cell from the bone marrow into circulation and this is a very good effect because high concentration as I said would have a protective effect for your ischemia and heart failure. Now third now to measure angiogenesis exactly then what we have to do is we have to see the angiogenesis in a naked eye. So, possibly we cannot do it on a human study because the heart has to be removed and they have to be stained and the stained heart you have to look at uh, if there is any capillary 
a, a capillary increase or we call as a capillary density can be measured by the strain technique. So, this was an animal study which was done in Sun Yat-sen University in uh, China. So, what they did they took a beagle dog and uh, they, uh, they, 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 they did a, a EECP I mean they occluded the LED. So, what they did is they want to create a myocardial infarction. So, they occluded the LED for 30 minutes and after 30 minutes of occlusion there is a significant drop in the LV function. So, from the 50 to 60 percent of EF it dropped to 32 percent and the LV is got dilated and out of 12 dogs one got one dog died of uh, arrhythmias. So, we know they have able to create an infarct into the dog heart. And then what they did it all the dogs in a standing position they did 35 days of EECP. It is really a very cumbersome procedure it is very difficult to actually do a counter pulsation on a dog. But I think somehow they managed to do every day one hour for 35 days and after 35 days they found out the LV function significantly improved and the blood pressure is also normalized after 35 days of EECP and then they sacrificed the dog and stained it. Now you can see there is a significant improvement in the capillary density. So, increase in capillary density is a direct correlation with angiogenesis. So, they have more blood vessel has formed and then there is a uh, great increase expression of wedge of vascular endothelial growth factor expression is high. So, somehow it is stimulating the uh, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor into the myocardium and then there is an increase in smooth cell and then endothelial cell growth. These are all the example to show that angiogenesis has actually happened in the myocardium in the lower animal dog. So, it is very difficult to translate into human, but we have an idea that it is actually happening in the dog because it is it's actually normalized the LV function also after the 35 days of EECP, which may be unlikely in human because the human collateralization is much slower to respond than animals collaterals. Now, let me take about the take home message of this angiogenesis. Now, we have clearly shown EECP can stimulate angiogenesis. The mechanism is it can increase the wedge of, it can increase the myocardial ischemia which is assessed by a spec or a myocardial perfusion scan and as shown by a invasive catheterization it can show that collateral flow index can improve and fractional flow reserve and then enhance external counter pulsation shown to increase the circulating repair cell. So, increase in endothelial progenitor cell, increase in hemopoietic progenitor cell and also decrease the myocardial oxygen demand. And also we have shown a post infarction study in an animal model, it is increase the capillary density, increase the expression of wedge up, increase the endothelial growth and increase the smooth muscle cell growth. So, with this introduction let us move on to our next module and how EECP effect in endothelial cell function and arterial stiffness. Now, Initially, let us go for a, another animal study. It is also uh, uh, it is a study which is done on the pig in the animal and what they did is they have three group of pigs. One is a control and one is a cholesterol and one is a cholesterol and EECP. The what they did is each group the first group is a control they gave a normal diet or normal healthy diet for a, a pig and then they fed with a high cholesterol diet and then the third one is they fed with a high cholesterol diet and then did EECP 35 session. They sacrificed all the animal and they took the LAD and then they looked at the endothelial endothelial uh, through the micro uh, through the electron microscope. Now, if you see the first one control uh, the endothelium is normally aligned in a good fashion or in a parallel fashion and second when you go to the second group which is fed with high cholesterol diet you can see the luminal surface was covered with many adherent cells foam cells and cholesterol accumulation and the endothelial cell were in disarray. And the third one is the EECP the high, high fed cholesterol peak which has undergone a 35 days of EECP. Here you can see surprisingly there is a less cell adherence and endothelial cell aligned parallel to the direction of flow. So, it clearly shows by the electron microscope the endothelial function is normalized. So, here even after you fed the pig with a high cholesterol by doing a 35 days of EECP has able to show a normal endothelial function. Now, let me explain how it can be applied to a human. The first one shows the intracoronary pressure and velocity can be achieved very high with EECP 
and because with a very high velocity what it creates is a shear stress. Shear stress is nothing but is a tangential force which is a friction which caused along with the blood flow to the endothelial function. Because of the friction it depends if the tangential force or the shear stress is very low it is an orthogenic property. It may cause us orthogenesis and orthosclerosis and thromboting. But if the shear stress goes over a particular value more than I think uh, 15 uh, dyne then probably it will have a protective effect. Now, we know from our previous slide EECP significantly increase the velocity and the pressure. So, basically the shear stress is very high during EECP. So, when the shear stress is very high now what it happen is it stimulate what calls ENOS is a nitric oxide synthase enzyme nitric oxide synthase it is an enzyme which stimulate the nitric oxide formation or the vascular relaxation factor. This nitric oxide is a very potent vasodilator and it is also an antithrombotic and it can protect the crackling of the endothelial cell and protect it against any thrombus formation on atherosclerosis. So, once the nitric acid level goes up the, the vessel which is uh, less compliant become high compliant and elastic. At the same time the also the endothelial release at the when it is a dysfunctional state another potent uh, factor called endothelin. This endothelin is actually a vasoconstrictor and we call as a bad factor because it causes vasoconstriction, it causes thrombosis, it caught crackling in the endothelial, so it causes uh, obstructions or atherosclerosis. So, EECP after 35 days in human study can show from this slide you can show baseline first hour, 12th hour, 24, 36 and 3 months. So, the, the level is increased as per the dosage of EECP and it is maintained even after 3 months. Many times when you treat EECP patient within 3 to 4 days they said doctor feel very good now my angina is not there I am going to walk more distance. But it is unlikely that collaterals would have happened even during the 3 to 4 days. We expect the collateral to develop between 15 to 15 to 20 days because many times a perfusion scan done during the halfway, th halfway through the EECP has established shown in many trial that increase the perfusion. So, we would not expect to have a, a collateralization within 3 to 4 days, but the patient feel better because of the increased nitric oxide level. And again if you go to the endothelin from the baseline 1 hour, 2 hour as the, as the EECP treatment increases, the days increases you can see the down sloping, there is a drop in the endothelial, uh, endothelin level. So, the increase in nitric oxide decrease in endothelin is actually a favorable effect in vascular endothelium and we can show this is the effect that the vascular endothelium has responded and in the animal study possibly the decreased deposition of cholesterol and the endothelial function is uh, it's normal because of this effect of nitric oxide and decrease in endothelin. Now, as I said before to measure this increased nitric oxide level and endothelin there are two tests one is reactive hyperemia peripheral artery tonometer and brachial artery uh, flow on, flow on mediated vasodilatation. I think I explained the brachial artery and reactive hyperemia is a kind of a small uh, probe which put it in the finger and it can able to measure the hyperemic response or the small vessels in the finger to hyperemic means it should dilate more the dilatation happen in the small fingers better the endothelial function and you can see this uh, EECP pre and post 1 hour 17 35 1 month. So, un after even completion of the treatment the endothelial function which is improved during the treatment is sustained even after 1 month of completing the treatment. Now, the third one is when if you see there is an improvement in endothelial function as we measured by a couple of tests I have clearly shown. Now, the overall improvement is the arterial stiffness. Your large vessels or your muscular vessel can contract or dilate or constrict or dilate. If the muscular artery goes for constriction, we know the heart has to pump against the constricted vessel. So, it need more load and more force and it has an increase in oxygen demand and need more oxygen. But if the arterial stiffness is reduced, then the heart can pump easily into the reduced peripheral vascular resistance. The most of the peripheral vascular resistance are given by the arteriole and then by the muscular artery. Now, if the arterial and the muscular artery are dilating means your endothelial function is improving. So, if the arterial stiffness is reducing means actually you are doing a favor by making the dog making the heart to pump easily. Now, this is what we call pulse wave velocity. Pulse wave velocity is when the heart contracts it pushes a blood into the circulation which we all know. At the same time it also pushes a pressure wave. This pressure wave 
transmit in the uh, transmit throughout the arteries and it bounces back and come back to the point of origin so this traveling of the uh, pressure waveform is what we call a pulse wave velocity if this pulse or the pressure waveform travel very fast high pulse wave velocity then you have a stiff artery if it travel very slow then it has a elastic artery so it is having a decrease in stiffness so eecp have shown to decrease the reflective wave speed or pulse wave velocity so it clearly show it has a positive effect on the muscular and the arterial now the second now many times people ask if eecp is such a simple procedure which can able to increase the blood flow to the heart muscle without actually patient going for a interventional procedure a bypass or angioplasty why it cannot be used as a preventive treatment now this is one study they what they looked at is they looked at the brachial blood pressure aortic blood pressure and wasted left ventricular energy so now you can see after 35 days of eecp because of the continuous exertion or the continuous increase in flow not only to the coronary blood vessel but to an entire vascular system the vascular system respond by decreasing the systolic pressure in the sense the peripheral vascular resistance or the vessel gets dilated so here in the study there is a significant drop from 132 to 121 almost a 9 to 10 mm drop in systolic pressure and there is a mild drop in the diastolic pressure and you can look at the central aortic pressure and central pulse pressure so the pulse pressure also there is a significant drop in the brachial and the central aorta and the central aortic pressure is actually measured by a non invasive technique called spigmocor where we can derive the central aortic pressure by putting a small tonometer on the radial artery so here we are able to measure the central pressure and brachial pressure all decrease with eecp so it is a kind of an exercise or i would say it is a intense exercise which has effect after 35 days there is a drop in the pressure and also we call as a wasted lv energy wasted lv energy means if your vessels are stiff heart has to pump against this resistance so some of this energy are wasted because of the pressure it has to pump against the resistance if the resistance fall down because of the dilatation of the vessel you have less resistance so you have less wasted of lv energy now this slide shows a circulating level of pro inflammatory markers so this pro inflammatory markers increase if the shear stress is very low and if the shear stress is very high this is supposed to drop down because low shear stress has causes atherogenic property causes atherosclerosis and high shear stress is actually a opposite effect it anti atherogenic and anti thrombotic which i have explained before now eecp when when we do eecp for 35 days when they measured in the sham group which has uh, uh, in in case they came from eecp but not pressure is applied on the lower limb and second is an active you can look here the tumor necrosis factor significantly reduced in eecp and monocyte chemo attractive protein also reduces and vascular cell adhesion molecule also reduces so this shows in eecp has a positive influence on the vascular endothelial or vascular remodeling so when this happen the drop in the pro inflammatory factor and it correlates with the clinical outcome you can see the patient canadian cardiovascular society drop from 3.1 to 1.2 and anginal episode drop on 1.6 to 0.4 and nitroglycerin intake also dropped this shows eecp has a positive effect and it can improve clinical symptom by altering or remodeling the vascular endothelial cells now to summarize all the mechanism which we have spoke about here you can see we compress the leg both compartment arterial and venous which increases the uh, retrograde blood flow into the aorta and increases the coronary perfusion pressure and the venous vein compression results in the increase in cardiac output and you can show the sheer vascular stress not only to the coronary endothelium but to the entire systemic endothelium which improves the endothelial function and also changes the neurohormonal release so there is a decrease in endothelial level increase in nitric oxide and also release various growth factor and in turn causes angiogenesis and enhance the collateral so this summarizes the overall mechanism of eecp now the take home message about the endothelial cell function is here the increased blood flow velocity and shear stress acting on the endothelial cell actually improves the endothelial cell function it is measured by increase in nitric oxide decrease in endothelin increase in vasodilatation decrease in vasoconstriction and increase in flow mediated vasodilatation which is measured by fmd or flow mediated vasodilatation by putting a cuff on the brachial artery or decrease in arterial stiffness which is assessed by was a technique called spigmocardiography 
and increase in angiogenesis growth factor, increase in coronary flow reserve, intimal hyperplasia, decrease in pro-inflammatory cytokines and increase in uh, circulating endothelial progenitor cell. All this effect will reduce the hypertension, improve the blood flow, reduce atherosclerosis and the clinical benefit is preventing the initiation and progression of the cardiovascular disease. All these effects are very important in using ECP in the preventive cardiology in the future. But currently in US it has been approved only for refractory angina and in India we are also using it for uh, heart failure. Now with all this uh, introduction on mechanism of action, now the idea is how this improved in the uh, uh, mechanism of action after understanding mechanism of action, how it is actually changing the clinical outcome. Now when you look at the angina now, so the EECP improves the exercise tolerance and quality of life in patient with refractive angina. It was confirmed by the MUST EECP trial which is a randomized blinded control trial. You can look there is a sham group and an active EECP group and after completion of 35 days there is a significant increase in the exercise time and significant increase in the time to the ST segment depression. And this trial is, a, is a one of the pivotal trial in uh, EECP and this brought EECP into the refractory angina and it is approved by the Medicare. And now this is a registry data which we want to show it for patient with uh, angina. Now it is a demography, there are 7000 patients who have followed up to 3 years and if you look at the basic demography you can see almost 75 percent have them hypertension and if you look at the risk factor baseline, the CAD diagnosis almost 11, uh, 11 years of CAD and prayer myocardial infarction almost 70 percent have the history of MI and multivessel. So multivessel coronary artery is almost in 80 percent of the patient, heart failure in 31 percent. So altogether the demography shows these are all the sick group of population who have already attempted all the existing modality for the treatment of coronary artery disease and still they are now symptomatic. So these group of patient when they undergo for EECP and then they followed up for 3 years, let us see what happened. So initially at the baseline you can see 86 percent of them are in class 3 or class 4 which is a severe angina where they are not able to do even a regular activity or routine activities. Now one year 25 percent only maintain on the class 3 and class 4, in 2 years it is only 24 and in 3 years it is only 25 percent where they are in class 3 and class 4. So it shows 75 percent of the patients who significantly improved and they were able to maintain the benefit even 3 years after the completion of EECP treatment. Sorry. Now the 3 years follow up has showed its improvement is sustained in 75 for the patient in the 3 years follow up and uh, we have shown there is a mortality of almost 15 percent. So it is a very sick group of population and patient who are alive were able to out of the hospital and improve the quality of life even after 3 years of completing the treatment. So it is not like only one, uh, tri only one trial from the registry or uh, data from the registry. There are multiple trials you can see there are a lot of things in elderly patient, in diabetes, in obesity. All of them it has been shown the patient who have completed the treatment almost 75 to 80 percent of the patient have significant improvement in the quality of life, they were able to walk more distance than before, they were able to reduce the on demand nitri uh, nitroglycerin and their quality of life has significantly improves. So all these efforts are seen in a wide range of patients from diabetes to patient with peripheral vascular disease, patient with atrial fibrillation, patient with heart failure and lot of other, other groups. Now to summarize, the 35 days of EECP treatment has shown some clinical benefit and I am just listing all the clinical benefit. So it improves the myocardial perfusion, increase the time to ST segment depression, reduction in angina and heart failure functional class, improvement in quality of life, decrease in anginal episode and the effects are sustained even up to 5 years. There is a small study to about 50 patients, I think 35 to 50 patients have shown the benefit last even up to 5 years. So the mechanism of action which I have explained to you very clearly. Now let us go to the heart failure. Now heart failure is a condition where it is a terminal part of the what we call as an angina. As I said patient with the angina might have a heart attack and the heart attack would lead to reduction in the LV function and reduction in LV function is what we call as heart failure. So heart failure is heart failure with low ejection fraction or heart failure with median ejection fraction or sometimes heart failure with normal ejection fraction we call as a diastolic dysfunction. Now the similar to the 
uh, uh, MUST trial, there is another trial called PEACH. PEACH trial was done for patient with heart failure. As you show, there are uh, the co-primary endpoint is how many patients were able to do 60 seconds uh, after the course of 35 days of EECP and, the, and how many patients could have able to increase the VO2 max, max and then the secondary endpoint or change in exercise time, quality of life and VO2. So, this is a flow chart. 800 patients have screened in the 228 to 228 patients are randomized and 93 are in the EECP group and 94 on the control group and they did EECP and followed up for uh, 6 months to look at all the co-primary and the secondary endpoint. Now the primary endpoint as I described before, the secondary endpoint we need to look at the NYH classification, quality of life and any adverse event. Now this is a demography, you can see that what I want to point out here is the LV function, patient with EECP and control have significantly very low ejection fraction, we consider as almost end stage heart failure and now they are all in their medical management of ARB, AC inhibitor and beta blocker and still they are symptomatic. Now you look at the primary endpoint, the 6 months follow up study, the exercise duration significantly improved. The patient who are able to exercise more than 60 seconds is almost 35% uh, in EECP group and in only 25 in the control group. It is statistically significant and peak VO2 did not reach the statistical significant, but there is a trend towards the improvement in the patient who are undergoing EECP or the actual treatment group. And in the subgroup analysis, we have found out in patient older age, more than 65 years old, there is a significant improvement in peak over 2 also after EECP. So, the overall exercise time and the overall peak VO2 are significantly improved in patient with greater than 65 years old and the improvement in exercise duration is significantly improved even after 6 months of completion of the treatment in the overall group. But the peak VO2 were able to achieve a significance only during the post EECP and the 3 months and 6 months did not reach statistical significance. So, the quality of life and Minnesota life living with heart failure questionnaire also improved with EECP. Uh, post EECP and 3 months and 6 months it did not reach the uh, statistical significance. So, what we have to do is in this sub analysis, the, when we look at the etiology as a ischemic, the patient with ischemic etiology who undergone EECP did better than patient with non ischemic etiology. But the PEACH trial has a combination of the both ischemic and non ischemic, but in the subgroup analysis, it is very clearly evident the ischemic group of patient did better with EECP when compared with the non ischemic. So, you can see here the ischemic and non ischemic, the one week, three months and six months follow up of exercise tolerance or improvement in exercise duration is very significant or statistically significant even after six months of follow up, which is achieved only in patient with ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy. Now, what is the conclusion of EECP in the treatment for heart failure? For patient with NYH class 3 and 2, heart failure symptoms with LVF less than 35 percent, EECP therapy can improve the exercise tolerance, quality of life, functional status uh, when compared to optimal medical management alone. And patient with ischemic etiology with age over 65 did better than patient with non ischemic etiology. The PEACH results are consistent with those in prior studies with of the MUST ECP with for the stable patient and with preserve LV function. So, the additional registry data which I am going to show, it not only followed up to 6 months, we also followed the patient up to 2 years. <coughs> now, this is another trial to show it is not a randomized control trial, but to show the effect of EECP in patient rehospitalization and emergency room visit. So, prior to EECP patient who have high hospitalization and emergency room visit after 35 days of EECP has significantly reduced rehospitalization and emergency room visit. And it is also shown that the cost uh, saving it is enormous when if you take EECP when compared with managing, or managing them on medical management alone. Now, here is a 2 years follow up study on EECP. Now, if you look at the demography as in the previous PEACH trial, it is a very sick group of population where the average EF is less than 28 percent and you can look almost 45 percent of the diabetes and history of heart failure in 61 percent and almost uh, 
68 percent hypertension. So, this treatment, this patient, a sick group of patient, they did the three, uh, 35 days of EECP and they were able to follow up to 2 years. They showed almost 2 years survival rate of 83 percent and almost 55 percent of the patient had sustained the improvement in angina even at the end of 2 years. So, as a take home message what I want to conclude is now the evidence EECP is safe, it is effective, it increases the blood flow to the coronary uh, into the myocardium, it improves endothelial function, it improves the neurohormonal level, it reduces arterial stiffness and all these things put together it improves the patient's quality of life and it is helpful in angina and heart failure. Now, all these data now it is supported by more than 160 publication and 7 randomized trial. Now, with this we will move on to patient selection and outcome. So, how do you select patient for EECP? Number 1, primary utilization of EECP to revascularize anginal. So, many times we choose patient as a EECP as a primary option because these patients may not be able to go for an interventional procedure because of other reason. Number 1 is personal preference that they do not want to go for an interventional procedure or they may have a comorbid. Second is surgery and PTCA not contemplated. Many times patient refuse or patient may have a diffuse vessel or multi vessel diesel or complete revascularization is not possible. Sometimes the surgeon or interventionalist would be able to offer you only a partial revascularization in that all the vessel cannot be grafted or all the stenosis cannot be stented. In that case also EECP would have a favorable effect to improve the global myocardial blood flow. And second is patient with severe LV dysfunction because when your heart function is very low, you will be a high risk candidate for a CABG or PTCA, then they might be a candidate for EECP. And sometime in India, we use EECP as a preparation for revascularization. So, patient with severe LV dysfunction who in an account of an interventional physician or a uh, cardiothoracic surgeon might require IABP, surgery, IABP support during a bypass surgery will do a 15 to 20 session of EECP to improve the collateralization and then they may take uh, able to take for a CABG uh, or a PTCA to reduce the uh, uh, mortality or uh, procedural mortality. And third is a heart failure patient whether they are ischemic or non ischemic. And finally, is a cardiac X syndrome. These group of patients have, have microvascular disease, their epicardial uh, coronaries are normal. So, they are not a candidate for a bypass or angioplasty and EECP could be the only option. So, patient selection as for the FDA labeling is for stable and stable angina, congestive heart failure, acute myocardial infarction and cardiogenic shock. But recently it has been uh, uh, redrafted that EECP is only allowed for patient with refractory angina in US. And what are the contraindication? Any contraindication for an intraortic balloon pump will automatically become a contraindication for EECP. So, patient with arrhythmia which interfere with, the with, interfere with machine uh, triggering or bleeding diastasis or any active thrombophlebitis or presence of any aneurysm or a history of any aneurysmal repair are all absolute contraindication and some of them are relative contraindication is patient with decompensated heart failure or with severe pulmonary hypertension or patient with uncontrolled hypertension all these patients has to be properly treated before they put on to the EECP. So, the general recommendation or evaluation of the patient before putting on to the EECP. So, the patient should undergo certain evaluation to show that they do have ischemia. So, the ischemia should be documented before prescribing anything for a EECP. So, you may have a stress nucleotide perfusion or echocardiography or if the patient is a heart failure, make sure you assess there is no severe Krebs or pedal edema or a high pulmonary uh, pressure. These are, the, these are the patients who are called as decompensated and may get worsened during the procedure or patient who have atrial fibrillation who are an anticoagulant and ILR is more than 3. And as I said, you assess the patient outcome by augmentation ratio or we call as a diastolic augmentation. Better the diastolic augmentation, better the outcome. In many times patient might have a poor diastolic augmentation because of peripheral vascular disease, because of iliofumeral obstruction, these type of patient or deep vein thrombosis or severe peripheral vascular disease, even though you put a cuff pressure of uh, 
260 or 280 or 300, they may not achieve a diastolic augmentation, they may not able to achieve the highest blood flow to the coronary circulation, so they may not benefit. But even patient with uh, peripheral vascular disease, EECP can be treated, but they require more session than the standard 35 days of EECP and atrial fibrillation. Because if you have a very irregular heartbeat, make sure he put on certain drug to manage your irregular heartbeat and if it can be managed, they can be taken to the treatment or if the ECG is very irregular with frequent PVC or arrhythmias, they may not benefit because the machine cannot sync with their inflation, deflation with their uh, diastolic or synchronization become a problem or the pacemaker and defibrillator still can take the EECP. But patient uh, with motion during EECP may, may, lead, may, may lead rate adaptive pacemaker to trigger a pace tachycardia and these patients should be actually programmed off. So the protocol as we know every day, one hour, 35 days for 6 weeks It's what we are doing in India. In US it is actually for a 7 weeks, 5 days because in Saturday, Sunday they do not do the EECP treatment. In India we do Saturday and sometimes we do even on Sunday. So I would say the treatment protocol it should be between around 4 weeks to 7 weeks. And many times we might require to repeat the procedure in patient with chronic stable or heart failure because 18 percent of the patient came back after 2 years with recurrent symptoms and we do not have to worry even with recurrent symptom a 35 days of EECP have shown to significantly improve the uh, patient's quality of life and decrease intake of on demand nitrates. So the clinical efficacy as I said the mechanism of action and the clinical evidence and safety and effectiveness in treating patient with angina and heart failure. So we can say around 70 to 80 percent of the patient whether in angina or heart failure they have a significant improvement after the 35 days of EECP and these patients if they treat carefully during the, proce during the procedure may not go for any, uh, any uh, treatment related complication. One of the most important complication you should be able to screen the patient or you will be very careful during EECP is patient with uh, pulmonary hypertension or with pedal edema or with flu fluid overload. Because once you start EECP, it may increase the pulmonary hypertension and may cause us a pulmonary edema. So they have to be treated in caref with careful, ca with very careful uh, medical management. Now the second is current status of EECP. So with all the evidence on outcome, on mechanism of action, where does EECP actually stand? Now as you say, I think in 2000, the American Journal of Cardiology has put EECP on the front cover because of one reason. Until then, we thought if you want to improve the blood flow to the myocardium, it can be done only by mechanically manipulating the coronary arteries or the epicardial arteries, either by doing a bypass surgery or angioplasty. Now, this is the first time which is proven by myocardial perfusion scan that is another treatment called a non-invasive procedure EECP could do improve the myocardial perfusion. So, it has been approved by US FDA and it is also covered in the guideline of American College of Cardiology and European Society of Cardiology and you all know it has been approved by Medicaid and Medicare and India also many insurance companies is currently approving the EECP treatment. <coughs> now here is a guideline. So the guideline is usually consists of two things, one is a class of evidence and then is a class of recommendation. EECP comes under the class of evidence B, then it shows at least one positive randomized trial and class of recommendation 2B was given by American College of Cardiology. 2B means the benefit is much better than the <coughs> risk it may possess. But it would suggest the physician to may consider it as an option when they are exhausted all their management. <coughs> now the European Society of Cardiology went one step ahead and then the class of recommendation as 2A. 2A means the benefit is much more than the risk and it is not may considered, it says a physician should consider EECP as an option in patient with coronary artery disease who are refracted to medical management on who are not a candidate for a, a interventional procedure like bypass and angioplasty. So these are all the cardiology textbook recently if you see all the time dates 2012, 11, 13. So there is a, rev there is a lot of interest in uh, Asia Pacific and U US about EECP. Now there are a lot of test books and chapters are covering the role of EECP in heart failure and angina. Now this is our publication in India to the cardiology society to show the selection criteria for patient with angina and for the insurance company how to reimburse EECP based on the recommendation from the cardiology society of India. 
And here, as I said, EECP is not only a treatment for the end stage when you exhausted all your option, it can be also used as a preventive tool. And this we published a paper in cardiology today that cardiovascular disease protection and regenerative potential of enhanced external counterpulsation therapy. And here we have put up another paper in India which is the effect of EECP in treatment to reduce aortic blood pressure, arterial stiffness and also improve the ejection fraction in patient with heart failure. So, this is another one to support our idea that EECP can be used as a preventive tool. It is actually published in the uh, abstract publication in the American Heart Association recently. So, what we did is when we did a 35 days of EECP to the patient with hyperlipidemia or a dyslipidemia, we have seen a significant change in the lipid profile. The LDL, HDL, triglyceride and cholesterol level reduced in the range from 20 to 25 percent and also there is a significant increase in the HDL level about 7 to 8 percent. So, in 35 days to achieve this change in lipid profile, it is not possible by a <coughs> statin or by a regular exercise. So, I, we believe that EECP has a tremendous potential as in the preventive cardiology because the, the, the flow it increases, it is not only specific to coronary artery to the entire vascular system and because of the sheer stress is caused to the vascular endothelium, there are a lot of changes which happen in endothelial function, angiogenesis, neurohormonal and remodeling even to the myocardium and to the endothelium. All these things might be able to change the risk factor progression also. We have shown it reduces a lipid, it reduces a blood pressure and also studies are done to show it has an effect on the blood pressure, I mean the blood sh sugar level both in the fasting and in patient who are considered to be a, a pre-diabetic status. <coughs> With that I want to conclude that uh, EECP is a non-invasive treatment option for patient with angina and heart failure and it is also an emerging treatment and all the mechanism of action clearly shows it could be beneficial and the mechanism of action is angiogenesis and improvement in the endothelial function and in the future role we believe EECP could have a better option as a preventive treatment rather than using on an end stage or using when all the treatment option is exacted. Thank you very much.